Hello everyone, welcome back to the Two Line Pass. Today I'm going to talk about Dean Latorno, the Boston Bruins first round pick from 2024. I want to chiefly focus on things I'll want to see added to his game when he makes this massive jump from the prep school level all the way up to the collegiate game in a few months. Um, things that I want to see added that will give me confidence that he's tracking the right direction and growing as a prospect. And, and as we dive in, I just want to say, I, I definitely have time for this player. There's a wide range of opinions out there from various scouts for various reasons. And I'll get into those later on in the video, but what we'll do is we'll take a partial game here, shift by shift, uh, prep hockey playoff game against uh, Northwood School. So here we have a good Ozone retrieval coming out of the corner. Doesn't make a ton of space for himself with his body, but he trusts the skating and his reach to make a play, and this is a good play. And then here he does, doesn't show as much confidence in the skating here, covering the point, sort of just drifts off the spot, doesn't hold the spot, and that's okay, especially for shift. It's a kind of a questionable situation. Not the softest sauce. Um, then coming back on the rush, this is a tough spot because there, there's no support. And one thing about him that I don't love is his pace control. He rarely stops up and looks for second wave offense or buys time for support. And, and, and here's the thing, and I, I'm going to pick on him uh, with, with, with using his body and the timing of his body usage. Here he's going to get run off the road by a 5'10 defenseman. And because he just he invites that contact and he takes almost the full brunt of it. Uh, to his credit, he stays with it, and the puck somehow makes it all the way back to the far point, but that's more of a product of this level of play. And we'll just look at just his body mechanics and usage as the video goes on. Regarding level of play, and I don't know if I'm going to get to it in this video, but I like to use the terms exploitative dominance versus scalable dominance, and it, it, that might be worth a video all unto itself, because scouting at the prep school or Minnesota high school level is a lot different than some other levels. Anyway, pass reception here on the power play. I wish there was anticipatory movement with the pass reception because that's what creates the lane. If he's trying to break the stride of the PK guy with that lead hip pass reception, it wasn't effective. And then there's nothing done to break that stride. So he's trying to buy time while standing still, just trying to reach his way out of it. And that doesn't work here. It's not going to work in college either, much less the much less the pros. Conceptually, it's a good look, but the physical execution and anticipatory piece isn't quite there. And then, you know, again, mental game. Harassed, last guy back here. There's already a right-handed shooter on the flank. You've already done this position switch once this shift. It was probably time to do it again, even if it's just for good support, good habits. He's sort of an interesting type of project pick, you know, finger finger quotes there, because he doesn't really have a technical skill that is can't miss. He has good hands, not great. He has a good shot, but it's not a bomb like, say, Tage Thompson had at the same age. He's huge at 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, and he can skate really well at his size. And he's also not a nincompoop, which is great. Sometimes that's the thing, is you just hope that the six foot seven guy works out, even though he, he can't tie his skates. He's also not a genius. He's on a, on a three to nine scale. He's probably a six ish hockey sense wise, and that's probably about right for his skill level too. Maybe that's a six and a half, which is a really good base for this caliber of athlete, um, and and where Boston selected him. Uh, full disclosure: I, there's a short shift I'm skipping here. It's very start and stop, and nothing happens. I think one thing that most evaluators agree on with this player is that we wish there was some more compete and a more I don't know, a direct style of play, a, a game with more intentionality. That's more fair than to say compete because he's not lazy. Now, I give some players a bit of leeway on this. I talked about this in the Max Swanson video. That guy cannot afford to take many shifts off or else he'll get lost in the wash in a second. Bigger guys don't and generally can't play at 100%, 110% all game long. And, and frankly, it's a little silly to expect that. But what I do ask is that you have intentionality in your game and you use your frame to your advantage consistently. Because if you don't use your advantage, then you don't have one. And you're just a regular 5 foot 10 style of player. So now I need you to work harder to compensate for yielding your advantage. And again, Latorno doesn't have this game-breaking technical skill that I must have. Anthony Mantha shows up once a month, bombs home a hat trick, and buzzes off. Pierre-Luc Dubois became a playmaking winger because he's good enough that he can do that from the sidelines without getting mixed up in a mess. The Tourneau doesn't offer that, so we need a more complete, well-rounded set of skills and traits to really make this work. Like here, we could offer more of a power game here by throwing a body wall between puck and defender here, but there isn't a deceptive quality here that makes the defender think anything but a pull move is coming, and it fails. That's an example of yielding your advantage because it wasn't the right time to just pull up pure hands play, leaving your entire body and puck exposed the entire time. 
And again, we talk about body mechanics and, and the timing. Here we go, miss body check. And you know, whether that's it's a timing issue and we're still trying to figure it out, or if if it's anticipatory in terms of the movement of the player against you, or if it's just a focus and determination thing, it's noticeable with and without the puck. Here we go, mopping up the end of a power play with some late time on the left flank. Here's a good handle though, good timing, an accurate pass to get the best out of the situation. And this is why you take this player so relatively high is it's it's beyond the skill and the, and the mental game. There's concepts right here. He, that's a good hit right off the face off. It helps his team get the puck back. That that's a really good play. It's not a start from scratch situation with him. There's there are elements to his game. There are mental components to his game that we can use. We're gonna watch here in the next sequence. This puck's eventually going to wind its way back to him, and he's gonna he's gonna walk with it. All right. We're not fully engaged, but that's a good reach pass, right? It, only a player with his type of reach is able to make that pass at that angle, which allows you to make those types of passes in the future. Hook pass techniques could be in the future. There's a lot of elements to his game that, that are very transferable even to the college level right now. Watch here. He's going to learn. Here's the switch, right, which we wanted earlier. The only thing I would say here is the next iteration of this is I'd like this to be a fake shot and then a pass to the wing and then drive down into that into that slot area and take advantage. This PK shift at the end of the period starts with him trying to escort the other Sutterman back a bit. And I kind of like that. There's there's likely some attitude associated with that. And I, I like that aspect. If he's going to have a little bit of just grind in his game, that'd be kind of nice. I'll give this PK shift a chance to breathe to mainly show off his small area of footwork and just the overall smoothness of his stride. Um, there's a good amount of fluidity in, in it when and when he's when he's strong enough and he gets the core strength going to get full extension out of it we could really be in business from a total mobility standpoint um, I'm gonna let the, uh, another shift play out and then we're gonna I'm gonna get away from this game we're gonna dive into a couple more things that I've seen in in games around this time so we're, we're talking about again we're talking about areas to develop what what we want to see it doesn't have to be now right it's a bit of a project it doesn't have to be now but what we want to see maybe this time next year. Um, usage of body to create space and to buy time, which isn't the same thing as just being a bully. If he went around just jacking prep school kids for their lunch money two strides after they give up the puck, I'm not overly interested in that. I'll take a mean streak, certainly, but you don't have infinite energy to use, so it has to be channeled the right way. And then speaking of buying time, we're talking about pace control. At points this year, I wondered about the patience and the variance of his playmaking ability, but on closer inspection, there is some upside in that regard that I see. Is it enough to be a center at the NHL level? I think it's too soon to tell. If I had to set the line, I think it's probably more like minus 120, minus 130 that he's a winger, but there's a lot of development runway still, and he has a profound skating advantage over a lot of other players at this point in time. So if he can gain the technical skill and progress in the mental game to um, manage all that ice that centers manage, as opposed to wingers who will play in a little box, centers have a lot of ice to manage. If he can figure a way to manage all that, then he'll track towards being a center. The, the predictability of his offensive game is another key point. He's easy to read in a group setting where at not everyone out here is going to be a D1 college player or even is good enough to be a USHL player. So the range for his technical development arc is high, but there's going to need to be a mental advent in terms of deception and then the aforementioned physical application of those skills. If nothing else, hopefully this video sheds some light on why this is such a complicated evaluation. How much skill is there? How competitive is he? Accounting for the level of competition he's playing at, etc. That's why there are some scouts that thought this was a mid-first round pick, and there's some that thought he was a sixth or seventh rounder, and everything in between. So let's dive in on a couple of more specific points to wrap up. So here we go. We're talking body usage in the interior and near the boards. He, he doesn't lay a finger on anyone in these multiple contested puck situations. And this is the quarterfinal, the prep hockey playoffs. We'll see in the next shift here. You know, and I, I cut it a little bit short, but this is this is more how a smaller skilled player would go about his business. This is this is almost like he's playing a little out of control, like the pace is too high for him. But it shouldn't be. There, but there isn't use of frame here. There is, there's hardly use of his skating. It, it's all hands. And that's maybe okay in certain situations. You have a speed differential advantage or what have you. 
but there needs to be just a little bit more substance and a little bit more pace control to what he's doing because this isn't going to be available to him. He, it, the levels don't get easier. Eventually, this this shift later on, it'll get reset, and sure, he hits a speed bump, and that's fine, but don't compound your problems and wing this puck into an odd man rush the other way. Look at the score. You're already up against it. You, don't make it worse. He'll, he'll finish this finish the shift with a with a crunch and that's great but it's it's the it's a cherry on top of employing puck protection techniques or it's on top of walling off defenders it's on top of capturing pucks in the interior it's not the sunday and we'll see here in, in his brief ushl action here you know it doesn't catch this puck and then he gets bodied pretty good like there isn't a lot of resistance here and i'm pretty sure that's a player in his same age group here we go, We're talking about predictability offensively, deception, and just staking a claim to your ice. I'm a nut for not giving up the dot line once you have it because it's hard to get back inside, but sometimes you have to, and sometimes you can take advantage of the situation uh, if you're talented enough. So there's a couple of instances here where the skates are going to turn because of his reach, and we talked about what, what that means. You, could, you turn toes to attack heels. But there isn't really any deceptive qualities here. He certainly doesn't power through this situation as he only gives ground to the defender. There's no stutter step. There's no jab step. There's no nothing on top of it here that would give the defender any sort of pause. So we're left with a contested reach hope play. Not that he was necessarily given the longest look in the USHL, and plus is he, when, when he was going to go back, a shoulder injury ended the season. But look at this next shift. Take a look. This is pretty good. I like this pick here after the pass because it shows good spatial awareness. That's a positive. Buy your teammates some time. And then we come back through on the four check. And, and this isn't the greatest, right? Like this is the outside stick tap. There's there's no intentionality there. So again, and I'll give him one more generally positive shift to close out on. It, it's the sort of pros and cons that you'd expect from a prospect of this type. Coming from a lower level, taken late in the first. And, and by the way, that's, that's sort of the other thing here. Not only do you have the self-applied draft capital and draft stock if you need to trade him down the line before he turns pro, but he also sort of comes with a built-in receipt, right? Uh, if your first round pick doesn't get signed, you get the compensatory pick in the same spot in the second round. That, naturally, you don't want that, and you might not have a job long enough to take advantage of that, but there's just a touch more incentive, a minor touch more incentive to try this type of player in the 25, 27, 29th overall area as opposed to 34, 36, 38. Um, there's, a, there's always a fair amount of jockeying for those first few picks in the second round, too, because players fall unexpectedly, and you get a night to hang out at the bar and make a trade or two, or whatever you like. Uh, in terms of a comparable, it's tough to say. I know Tage Thompson is a common one. Thompson definitely had a better shot at the same age. I think Tage had better hands, too, and was sharper and more decisive in his routes with the puck. I think Latorno's skating was better at the same age, if memory serves, but... Like, this is a worthwhile selection with a lot of range. There's a lot of pluses. Uh, there's a lot uh, of upside in terms of what he can become. Part of me wished for a USHL season so that the jolt of a high-level program wasn't so great, but that's life. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he had a tough freshman year and then had, had a gainful summer after that to sort of springboard him along and actually apply learned concepts to his game because it, it's not automatic. Anyway, that's all we got for this edition of the Two-Line Pass. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll talk to you next time.